Welcome back to the Courage Sessions. Uh, my name is Enrique Hasso. I am the Associate Director of the Texas Health Education Service. And we are really, really excited. I know I say this every week, but I'm super excited to welcome two amazing colleagues uh, with me today from the UT Medical Branch of Galveston. Uh, Teresa, would you mind introducing yourself first? You bet. My name is Teresa Silva and I'm here at UTMB Galveston and I'm the Director of Admissions. And we also have Ms. Tanya Neely. Hi, I'm Tanya Neely and I direct our student recruitment efforts. Uh, we were just reminiscing about how the first time we all met. I just celebrated my my uh, tenth year anniversary with the TMDSAS and JAMP office uh, here with Texas Health Education Service, and so we were just talking about uh, you know the first time we met and is uh, we have a long history together, and I'm really excited to have them both uh, here, especially knowing how busy this uh, time of the application cycle is. I'm really appreciative. So. We're just going to dig right into uh, some of the questions that you all have on um, both the Texas Health Education Service and the TMDSAS Facebook pages. So don't forget to ask any and all questions that you have. We're here till two o'clock to answer your questions about UTMB. Uh, first off, let's kick off with the first question about um, the curriculum at UTMB. Uh, can we talk about what makes the curriculum there uh, different or unique? Yeah, so, you know, our curriculum um, is not so much unique anymore because it, you know, I've listened to a lot of schools discuss their curriculum as well. Seems like a lot of schools are coming to onto the fold of doing more team-based learning, but we've been doing our curriculum for over 20 years. Um, it's called the Integrated Medical Curriculum. And there's a couple of things that make it unique. Uh, one of the things that we try to do is, um, integrate basic science material across the disciplines. So, um, you know, a lot of the things that you're learning now as a pre-med student, like biology, chemistry, um, you know, genetics, you know, that type of information is what we call the disciplines. It's integrated throughout all of the coursework that you're gonna learn. Uh, we also integrate clinical material with the basic science material. And so you're not just learning, you know, one particular thing about, um, you know, an area um, in, in, in medicine. So you're gonna learn a little bit of everything. It's gonna have a, a clinical correlation. And then they're gonna have some problem solving challenges. And so we do that a lot with what we call problem-based learning. And so that's gonna challenge you to utilize the information that you are learning. And we're hoping that you're gonna build on some skills um, you know, that will help you become a better independent learner as well as, um, you know, create some lifelong learning skills that you can take with you once you leave medical school. Now, um, our curriculum, like I said, has that problem-based um, problem solving feature in there. And so one of the things that we're hoping that you learn is, um, you know, how to work together in teams. And so that's going to be very important in the first couple years of the curriculum where you're going to have to, um, you know, feed off of each other as a, as a group. Um, when you're given a particular case or situation where you're gonna have to you know, think through um, what's going on and really dissect what's going on in this particular case, um, it hinges a lot on you being able to work uh, well with your peers. So, uh, and we also hope that you're going to acquire um, cl clinical skills pretty early. So you're not gonna actually get into the clinics until third year, but in the first couple of years, you will be able to do um, some, some clinical work. We do definitely um, give you some clinical exposure in our problem, um, a practice of medicine course. Um, and so, you know, for years one and year two, you're gonna have a lot of basic science uh, material that's gonna be presented to you, but we have a focus where it's organ-based. Um, and so um, the last course in the first year um, starts to hinge on that organ-based systems approach. And um, all of our courses are taught in between about a six, seven week period. So um, one of the things you're gonna get from our curriculum is that, well, I'm not supposed to curriculum, but at least in, in, in your classwork, you're only gonna have two exams. So you're gonna have a midterm exam and a final exam. Um, and so, you know, a lot of your contact hours will be, you know, through problem-based learning groups, um, but you'll also have an opportunity to um, listen to lectures, um, attend lectures, lectures virtually, um, but also, um, you know, just have an opportunity to do some practice of medicine. That's a longitudinal course across the um, first two years. And so um, in between,
between years one and year two, you'll get um, about eight weeks off. And then that time students usually take the time to do um, some summer experiences. They may do some research. They may do some clerkship experiences or what we call per, uh, um, preceptorships. Um, so you'll get a chance to, you know, delve into a little bit more about PEDS or about internal medicine um, as a outgoing first year student. And then um, after your second year, you will um, sit for the board exam and then um, promote into the third year of your clinical years. So years three and year four are going to look very similar when you go to other institutions um, where you'll have small internships that you'll have to um, participate in. And um, there'll be some electives that you can take mostly in third year, uh, but there are some in fourth year. And the benefit with that is, you know, when you're looking at some of the curriculum, you're not um, you'll see some basic courses or some basic um, areas of medicine, but not some of those specialized ones that you, you may be interested in doing. So um, the electives are there for you to be able to pursue that and you know, discover more if that's an area that you definitely want to go into. Um, so that kind of gives you a, a summary of what you can do. Um, there's also some special opportunities that you can take advantage of. And um, those could be anything what we call tracks. So you could have um, an emphasis in um, medical humanities or in public health or in research or in geriatric health or global health. So we've got several um, opportunities you can take there as well as some dual degree opportunities. Um, we have the master's um, in culmination um, the medical degree with the master's in business administration. You could also do a master's in um, clinical science. You can also do a master's in public health um, and also in medical humanities. So that just kind of summarizes it a little bit. I didn't want to take too much time, but, but that does give you kind of an idea of our curriculum. Yeah, that, that's uh, still quite a bit of, to go over. I'm sure we could have our own current session just about the curriculum. Yeah, uh, I, I, I do know that, um, and for those of you that haven't been to visit the campus in Galveston, uh, it's not just the medical school, it's actually a huge medical complex, uh, comparable to what you would see at any other school. Uh, but I think one of the big key elements is really just the, the interprofessional uh, development that happens. And I think that goes along with what you were talking about in terms of like lifelong learning and, and working in team-based uh, learning environments. Do you mind giving us just a quick overview of what uh, other health, health professionals, uh, health profession students they might be in, in, engaging with as a medical student? So we have four camp, or excuse me, schools on our campus. We have the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. We have our School of Health Professions, which encompasses like the um, the uh, Phys uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy, respiratory care, um, and clinical laboratory sciences. And we also have a school of nursing. Um, and so the school of nursing has a multiple you know, levels of students, undergraduate and graduate students. Um, our physician assistant studies program is actually up under the school of medicine. So that's another um, health professions program that we offer at UTMB. So, you know, you can find yourself at any point integrating with those particular students, um, you know, in some of your practice of medicine experiences, some of the PBLs, um, you would have some of those students engage with you. Um, there's an end of year practice or end of year um, exercise that's done that in, in involves all of the um, health professions. So, um, you know, there's different opportunities and they're still developing more uh, where students can engage together. Awesome, thank you for those insights. Um, so we have some uh, members of your fan clubs uh, coming on and saying hi. First, we have Caleb Marsh. Hey, hi, Caleb. Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a uh, Sahar Fatani who's saying hi, Mrs. Neely and Ms. Hi. Silva. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for uh, watching today's courage session. We're going to hit some really great topics today. I think uh, the next uh, point is going to put you all in hot spot. Uh, with uh, on the hot seat for um, you know the admissions process. I do know um, some of the big discussion topics recently have been about how holistic review is coming into play, particularly with some major issues with students not being able to get the activities that they wanted to do over the summer or with delayed MCAT scores. Uh, but first and foremost, let's let's talk about the overall admissions process and how the mission and values for UTMB come into play in the admissions process. 
So, you know, our mission statement really is um, to improve the health of the people of Texas and around the world. And, you know, when you think about that, you have to think globally in terms of your application. Um, you have to think about your, um, your motivation for medicine and how you feel that you can impact um, health for people in Texas and around the world. So not that you have to specifically address that um, in your application, but it, it does come through with some of the things that you've participated in um, and some of the things that you provide to us, your, your explanations as to how those things have impacted your motivation for medicine. So we're gonna take a, look, a close look at those things as well. Now our vision is working together um, and so one that's, that's kind of a, a summary of, of our vision. And, and so when you think about working together, you, you have to think about our curriculum. And like I said, the first two years, you're going to be in small group experiences constantly. So that means that you have to show us or you know, demonstrate to us that you can work together in groups. You have the ability to be a leader and a follower um, and to be able to contribute and so those are things that we're look, going to be looking for in the application as well. Great. And then um, I believe this question might be for Teresa. Uh, how has COVID-19 affected the review of applications this year? You know, and, and we understand that, um, you know, it's taken a hit on all of our students and, and it's put everyone in a, in a predicament or in a situation that's not as comfortable or as usual or normal, should we say, as in the past. But we are, we are taking that into consideration, and um, you know, deadlines have been moved across all all Texas schools, and so, um, you know, we've extended our interview season into January, which uh, typically UTMB tries to finish them all up um, prior to the Christmas break, so that we can all just kind of unwind and, and get everything settled. But we know that everyone is having issues um, with COVID, and so we've extended all of our deadlines to help. Um, hopefully ease some of the tensions of students that are, weren't able to get in on some of those early MCAT dates. And um, we know that they're coming and we know that it's taking a little bit longer, but we're being patient with you guys and we ask that you do the same with us. Yeah, yeah and, and I think that's a, a kind of the resounding uh, rallying cry for a lot of the schools is there are so many changes that are going on in a really short amount of time at the schools. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of flexibility that the schools are exercising that may not have come into play before. Um, and, and we do have some of the um, statements that the schools have uh, collaborated on, for example, for spring of 2020, for those courses that were uh, in person that were moved online, those are now accepted by the schools. Online coursework for the summer will be accepted by the schools. Pass fail courses for spring 2020 are accepted by the schools as if they were in person and for the summer and beyond. Uh, if there is an option for you to take coursework uh, with a grade, that, that is what is recommended. Uh, and so check all of those out in our COVID-19 use room for TMDSAS. All of that information is provided for us directly from each one of our member institutions. Um, so in, in response to COVID-19, uh, what does it look like for students who are, are currently going through orientation? We actually just started orientation today. Oh, wow. um, and what we actually did was we had um, what we called some virtual town halls. And we had two of them um, prior to orientation, which again started today. And so it was a time where um, our vice dean and our deans could get together with all of our incoming students to kind of help them get to know each other and, and get to know um, the deans and just make sure that they didn't feel out of the loop because, you know, Right now, everything is changing daily with, with COVID and what's going on. We never know what's going to happen from day to day. And so we kind of wanted them to feel at ease knowing that, hey, we haven't forgotten you. We're working on it. We're constantly thinking of you. And we really, really are. Everything that we do has been centered around making sure that um, these students still get the best education they can, even though it's going to be virtual. Um, so we had two, two town hall sessions and we, you know, we explained what we were doing, how we were doing it, how things would be changing, and we allowed them to come in, ask questions, and, you know, we answered what we could at that point. The next, you know, town hall number two came in and then there were some changes again, um, but it kind of got them ready for this um, virtual 
life learning. So um, our students actually started their orientation sessions today. And again, everything's going to be virtual. Um, our first class is going to start on Monday and, and it'll be virtual as well. So knowing that the classes have gone virtual, does that mean that the interviews have also gone virtual? That's exactly what it Ooh. means. Yeah, we are starting um, inter our interview season on August the 19th, and um, those will all be via Zoom. Okay. Uh, do you have any advice for students who are preparing to do virtual interviews? You know, and, and I'm preparing my emails for them to try and give them as much information as I can. But what I would love to for you, the message for you to hear is even though you're at home, pretend that you're here on campus because um, you never know who's watching, who's, who's, you know, seeing what you're doing and how you're reacting with other students online. Pretend that you're here. When you go for your interview, dress as you would as if you were here on campus. Behave as you would if you were here on campus. And if I could kind of add some, some things that I think the three of us are, are kind of used to at this point that other students who may not be used to this type of medium uh, might know is, you know, first off, lighting is a very important thing. You want to be able to make sure that you can see who you are, uh, see your engagement, and also placement of your of your screen. Uh, for example, right now, to look at you directly, I have to look at a little dot on the top of my monitor. Uh, and you know, prior to moving things virtually, you know, you have the handshake that you want to make sure that you're firm, uh, but not. Um, over overbearing on, but um, you know, maintaining eye contact and maintaining your your uh, stream of consciousness and, and, and thought, um, and speaking with clarity. Uh, but obviously, with virtual interviews, it's a little bit more difficult. There, there's some additional things for you to consider. Uh, Mr. Marsh has actually shared a, a, an amazing article that he wrote for uh, Medium uh, that lines out some of the things that students should do to prepare for virtual interviews, and we'll be sharing that on the Texas Health Education Service website as well uh, later this month in preparation for these virtual interviews, because they are, they are uh, this is kind of a scary way to do interviews. Um, and we were just uh, talking about that right before starting this current session. But, you know, we, Enrique, we had a um, kind of like an interviewer sign up virtual fair yesterday for some of our faculty, mm -hmm. and they really are excited about this virtual aspect because there are some faculties that faculty members that are at different satellite campuses that we have, and so they weren't able to um, participate in some of these interviews. And so now that it's going virtual, um, they're actually pretty excited about it. And so it, it, may, it helps make us get excited about it. And, and while we know it's gonna be new and different, it's still gonna be okay. And we're gonna, we're gonna still get the best outcome. 100%. And I wanted to add that, you know, let's not forget the component of, you know, when you're, you're going for your interview, you're also looking at which schools you really wanna attend, you know, and you're trying to get information from that school and see if they're a good fit for you as well. So, you know, we're cognizant of that and we're, we've built in um, in, in our program um, time for you to be able to talk to our medical students and get a good feel for, you know, what life is going to be like on the island. I mean, you're not going to get to come um, physically or at least, you know, formally with us during your interview time, but we hope that uh, we can impress upon you, you know, what our community feel is like here at UTMB. Um, and then also just showing you our campus. We're gonna try to do a candid, you know, um, video where you can see what the campus is like. So still come prepared with your questions, um, you know, and, and learning more about our institution and, and if it's gonna be a good fit for you. Yeah, and I was just checking out the website earlier today and you all actually currently have a virtual tour of the campus. So for those of you that are curious to see what the, the campus looks like, that's also something that's available to you. Y'all are on the cutting edge. Not only was UTMB the first medical school in Texas and the only medical school on an island in Texas, uh, but you know they've, they've got their virtual interviews ready to go and, and some virtual uh, resources for students. You guys are gonna love it. We've got our you know student ambassadors that are helping put together some of these videos because we know that they can better you know reach some of you better with the age group that they are and that you are. And so we're, we're allowing those ambassadors to jump in with both feet and help us and show you how much they love this island and how much they love this, this school. 
And, and that's something that's really interesting is that, um, you know, we, we've talked to several professional schools at this point, but it's, uh, you know, each school has its own culture and the environment contributes to that culture. Uh, you know, last week we had Mr. Maldonado at, at uh, Texas A&M College of Medicine. And, you know, one of the points that we discussed was on the different Aggie uh, values that they have lined up and how those come into play. Uh, and of course here talking to you all, you know, we just went over some of the, the values and how the island contributes to that culture and the different professional schools that there are. Um, so each school is significantly different from the other. Uh, it's just like when you were applying to college all over again, because it's not just the, the benefits the school will have, but how good of a fit you're going to be for that school and how good of a fit that school is going to be for you. Uh, and one of the first things, one of the first things we always tell our students is, if you're here with us and you're interviewing, you're already great in our book. You are. You've met all the qualifications that we think um, will make a, a great student. And it really is about you asking the questions about UTMB, about our, our campuses, and see if, if it fits for you. Because we already know you're great. So mm -hmm. it is our time to shine, to show you what we have to offer and what we're about, but it's it's a good opportunity for you to find out if this is somewhere you wanna be. Right. Uh, we have a question that, that's come up here. Um, is there a way we could possibly visit the campus after the interviews? So we're hoping that, you know, we can you know provide something like that. Uh, we are really, up under the guidelines of the state, you know, and, and, and what we can actually do. Um, our campus is open in terms of, you know, walking the campus, but the buildings are still closed. So until um, those things have been lifted, you know, I can't guarantee when we could do that, but as soon as we can, we would love to inv invite everyone who's interviewed back down to campus or anyone that wants to come see campus. So we hope to be able to do that. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so we were just talking about the review of applications uh, and how those were affected by COVID-19. Um, could you talk to us about how CASPER comes into play for the review applications? So CASPER is something that we take very, very seriously here at UTMB. It's one of our deciding factors, if you will. Um, so it actually... Um, beginning this year, students will not be granted an interview if we do not have a CASPER score in hand. So if you haven't signed up for it, sign up for it now. We've gotten, I think, over a thousand scores that have already come in from students have gotten the word that, that it is something that is important for us in our review process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know that's one of the big discussion points right now with a lot of students is uh, you know, with MCATs delayed and uh, primary application deadline being pushed back and secondaries kind of being up in the air and, and figuring out what the timeline looks like, knowing that the, you just explicitly said that no student will be interviewed without a CASPER score. Uh, I think uh, our applicants should really take that into consideration, take it to heart, because uh, just as with the MCAT, the, there's a short turnaround for the CASPER and you want to make sure to keep that in consideration so that the schools have a full application to review uh, and, and give them as much time as possible uh, to review that application so that they are able to extend an interview invite. You know, Enrique, the good thing about the CASPER is that, you know, the students can take it at home. Mm -hmm. It's not like the MCAT where you have to actually go to a testing center. So the CASPER test shouldn't be an issue for anyone as long as you have a camera at home. Um, liter we've literally been getting tons and tons of scores that come in every day, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there are set dates for the CASPER assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely check out the, the links to that website. They are available on the TMDSES website under the next steps after applying in the secondary and CASPER section of the website. Uh, and that gives you a direct link so you can explore what, uh, what CASPER is, how to prepare for it, uh, spoiler alert, there really isn't a way to prepare for it. Uh, and, um, you know, how to do your best on that. Because it clearly is an important part of your application and you should consider it as such. But I want to mention something that I learned from a student at one of our recruitment fairs. 
um, and, and it was from UT Austin and just happened to be where we were at the time. And she told me that that institution actually had some sessions um, kind of explaining a little bit more about what the Casper, you know, Casper test is mm. and, and maybe gave them some sort of examples of something that might be on it. So um, you might want to reach out to your university and see if they have anything that's available like that, because I had no idea until she actually told me that her university was actually doing something like that for the pre-med students. That's interesting. Uh, I do know that the Casper website itself has like a sample question uh, with the sample scenarios. As you all know, it's a situational assessment test. And so it gives you a scenario and you're, you have certain questions like, uh, you know, do you turn in your, uh, your coworker because they gave somebody a refund on something even though it goes against store policy, mm -hmm. uh, for example. And, and so it's like, figuring out those situations and coming up with a response quick enough. Uh, and so there isn't quite necessarily a way to prepare for it, but uh, in speaking with other schools that have ca uh, implemented CASPER into their admissions process, uh, I think there's definitely a way to prepare yourself to have those responses ready to go because there is still a, a long way from your brain to your fingers to start typing something out. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. There are, there are tons of resources available. Uh, first and foremost, go talk to your advisor because they're going to be key in helping you with this process. And speaking of advisors, we have a question from Dr. Beck. <laughs> uh, uh, what opportunities exa exist for medical students under normal circumstances to continue volunteering community service work once they're in medical school? We have... Um student organizations, there's a number of, of organizations that um, have their own opportunities, you know, within their own groups to do uh, volunteer work. Uh, we even have some organizations that specifically, that's all they do is put together opportunities for other students to be able to participate in volunteering. Uh, we have a student run free clinic um, on the island. It's called St. Vincent's. And um, what I love about it is that, you know, even as a first year student, you can get involved with the clinic and uh, participate a couple times a week um, or however your schedule, or however they schedule it. Um, but, but there's opportunities for you to do some things there. Um, we also have some missions um, students participate in. So there's um, a place in Presidio, Texas, um, where students go and do some mission work as well. Um, and just within Galveston Island and, and, the, and the Galveston County, our students get involved, um, you know, with various groups um, on the island as well. Awesome, plenty of opportunities and surely they're all working on ways to continuing that uh, engagement even uh, in the age of COVID. Uh, we had a question that came up right now uh, It seems that they've removed it, but essentially it goes into the territory of, um, you know, what a complete application would look like. Uh, so could we go over a few scenarios in which we identify whether that would keep somebody from getting an interview invite? Uh, the first one was uh, for somebody who is, has previously taken the MCAT and will be retesting. Uh, would you wait on a retest score before extending an interview invite? So it kind of depends on what that first score is. So if you submit your application and, you know, and it looks complete in our eyes and it has a score, we're going to send it to the admissions committee. Um, the admissions committee will see that you're retaking that, that, that test. Um, if they see that that first score is not as competitive or as a score that we would like to see, they're going to automatically put that file on hold and said, we're going to come back to this one when the next score comes in. So we don't, we won't reject anyone out based on that first score when we, we know when we have evidence that you um, are seated for another exam. So we will just place it on hold when that new score comes in, we'll send it right back out. And what about with some letters of evaluation? Because I know there have been some delays uh, on getting those this, this year particularly. So UTMB has never um, not invited someone for an interview based on uh, letters of reference. If they're there during the, re the review process, fabulous. If they're not, it's still okay too. When we find that they are most reviewed is when we're making our final decisions. And so if there's no letters available when it's time to make final decisions, unfortunately, 
we won't invite we won't accept anyone without them but as far as interviewing if you don't have them it's always been our policy to invite students without them mm -hmm. anyway yeah and i think that might be different at some of the other schools sure. but uh, do keep in mind that the application uh that there's a deadline for supporting documents and it's about two weeks after the uh, the new October 30th deadline. So it'd be about, uh, November, I believe it's November 13th is the deadline for supporting documents with TMDSAS. Uh, and that does include test scores and your letters of evaluation. We also make it a point um, on the interview day to let you know if we still haven't received them so you can go back out and reach out to your letter writers and you know trying to give them a little nudge. Um, but we wanna make sure that you know that they're still not received. Great. Uh, another question here, have you ever had a student that looked pretty good to you, but the results of Casper made you think twice? Yes. <laughs> yes. Easy question, yeah. Yes. Uh, and I, think yeah, I'm, I can definitely tell you that we've had a 4.0 student with an extremely high um, MCAT score and mm -hmm. uh, the Casper score was just off on the other end of the range. and. Um, while they've been doing some sort of um, a little data collection with that, they've noticed that CASPER scores are making a difference in how students are able to communicate with patients. And so that's why we, we are taking it so seriously now mm -hmm. is because um, it shows us that some students may not be as socially ready to deal with patients. Yeah, and I, I think that's the CASPER really goes, coincides a lot with the core competencies that have been defined. And, you know, there are, there are different uh, characteristics that the schools are looking for, and that they're all very well defined. You know, you have dependability, adaptability, uh, accountability, you have um, responsibility to yourself and to others. And I think a lot of those elements really come to play in the CASPER. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know it's been over said that, you know, there isn't a wrong response to Casper, uh, but clearly there is. Clearly. Uh, and, and there's a there's a difference between, um, you know, from what I know about the test and your initial response and then trying to figure out what the schools want you to say, which is why it's such a time test. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of uh, different elements that go into the development and the uh, evaluation of the test that kind of serve as safeguards for that. Uh, I, so I, think it, I think it helps us to know which students may have trouble when it comes to clinical skills. And so that's why we find it such a, an invaluable tool. Yeah. And, and again, it's just another important piece of your application. Uh, regarding the application question about revealing crimes and misdemeanors, should an applicant reveal a situation in which their record was expunged? So that's a little bit of a sticky question. So, um, of course, whatever the application says, and I can't recall what it says offhand, maybe Enrique, you might know what it says as to what they're supposed to indicate. Um, I will tell you that when you get accepted, because we have a prison hospital on campus, you do go through um, two background checks here. And even if something is expunged, it always still comes up. So it, it may be somewhat of an issue, but as long as you can provide all the, the background showing that it was expunged, we can usually take care of and work with you. Yeah, and I think that's something that really is some on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. uh, what I always tell applicants is that always err on the side of caution and uh, mention everything that, that may come up. Because if you go through the process and it comes up later in a background check, uh, then that comes into issues with whether you lied on your application, uh, intentionally omitted that. And that gets into a huge uh, area that could be kind of messy for you. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, like I said, our background checks are very, very detailed because, you know, you will be rotating through the prison hospital that we have here on the island. And so that is one of the steps that you will have to go through and they do find things. Yeah. Uh, and I just pulled up the application handbook just to make sure that I'm uh, emphasizing what, what should be emphasized. But uh, the question on the application is whether or not you've been arrested or charged with any violation of the law, regardless of the outcome. Uh, 
And so unless the offense involved alcohol or drugs, you may exclude traffic tickets or violations with fines of $250 or less. Uh, but again, you know your situation best. Uh, always err on the side of caution and um, make sure that you include something uh, because it's a lot better to include it than to try to admit it. Uh, that could really come back and bite you. Um, we have a comment about our discussion on Casper. Uh, they're glad that we've talked about how the Casper could be uh, something that can hurt applicants. I know there have been a lot of misconceptions about Casper, um, and, and it's really important to know that it, it's, a, it's a tool that the schools use to help address, uh, as, as uh, Teresa just mentioned, uh, how students are going to fare in later parts of medical school. Uh, and interactions with patients. And I think that's that's why this tool is so powerful is that it's really assessing a part of the uh, a part of the student that the application doesn't already address. Uh, so yeah, th that is uh, something that's really important for the schools as we've just heard. Uh, a question I wanted to ask um, as, uh, and this might not apply right now, but in a typical scenario uh, as a UTMB student, uh, what options do students have for placements into a clinical clerkship for uh, those that part of the curriculum? You know, so our students are able to do most of their rotations and all of them here in Galveston. Um, we have some um, hospitals off the island, um, but still in Galveston County. We do have one in Brazoria County, which is about southwest from here. Um, so our students can rotate through all of those facilities. Um, we have a number of um, regional clinics. Um, so, you know, you may find yourself going off the island to do rotations there. Um, we also have um, a partnership with UT Tyler Health Science Center, and our students can do an, uh, almost their entire third year um, there. And so they, they've started out with a small cohort of students who could do that. Um, the goal is to expand that, but with COVID, I'm not sure where we're at with that. Um, but I do know that the opportunities are there. Um, students can also do their entire third and fourth year in, in Houston, I'm sorry. So mm -hmm. we've got some affiliations uh, with hospitals in Houston as well. So you could base yourself there, especially if you have a family. Sometimes that works out really well with students who want to like stay home. You know, if they have parents or family members that live in, in the Houston area, then they, they take that option. Or if you have a spouse or significant other that's working in the area, then that tends to help uh, with living situations. You know, So we do have a number of students that take advantage of that. Uh, but if you wanna do clerkships anywhere in Texas, other places in the United States, even internationally, you have those abilities to do that. There's a process you would have to apply for that um, with their um, instruction management office. Um, but yeah, there's many opportunities for you. Great, thank you. Um, so looking at um, not just a, kind of beyond our, our current applicants, but for future applicants who've been affected by COVID-19, let's say the freshman who's applying to UTMB in three years and their entire plan has completely been shifted by COVID. Uh, what advice do you have for them at this point? My advice is to um, remain optimistic. Um, you know, there are some things that you may be hindered to do right now, but that's, it's temporary, in my opinion. Um, one of the things that we're having to do just as much as you is to adapt to this new normal, if you will. And so we're finding a new strength in things that we didn't have before, you know, we're seeing ourselves be able to create new initiatives and, and, and new platforms that we, we didn't um, dis, um, discover or, or, or fully implement before. And so you, you've got to kind of think outside the box right now um, and what, how can I still show motivation for medicine or how can I still, um, you know, work on my, my soft skills so that I can show that this is still the area in which I want to go into. 
And um, this may be a time where you create something new that you just never knew that you could do, or you'll get involved in something that is outside of your comfort zone and you find that you really enjoy that. And I think that you're gonna grow from that. So I, I would encourage you to just continue to seek those opportunities and take advantage of as many of them as you can while you can. And I, I probably, we just gonna wanna piggyback on what Ms. Neely said and um, be creative. Because in this, in this time and in this situation and what we're all going through, it's just that. We're all going through it. And so there could be virtual opportunities out there, you know, just like we're, we're coming to you today virtually. There could be other virtual opportunities for you to seek out with, with uh, physicians or, you know, other health-related fields that you could reach out and do something virtually. So, you know, be creative. Yeah, and first and foremost, it's, it's really using that passion for the sciences and that passion for helping others, it's really going to make you stand out. Uh, and establishing that routine and, and engaging in activities like that over time, that's really going to make the difference in your application. Um, we've seen a, a lot, of, I, I've definitely worked with a lot of students, uh, particularly those who were reapplying and had a plan and they were ready to go because it and they were going to spend the summer and get some amazing activities and all of that went out the window. Uh, and so that their plan definitely fell apart for the most part, but they have found some really amazing opportunities. And uh, some of the students that I've worked with um, found some opportunities to translate in different uh, hospitals, not even in the same state. Uh, um, with this student, they, they were working with some hospitals in New York City uh, because they didn't have enough translators to help with the COVID situation. Uh, and that was all virtual. Uh, and then also I've heard of some additional opportunities for uh, scribing virtually due to the implementation of telemedicine. Um, and then of course, volunteer experiences are just all over the place, whether you wanna learn how to sew and create some masks for your community or, um, you know, working with younger students who don't have the, the full nine to five uh, class experience anymore, uh, engaging with them, reaching out to, to teachers, maybe getting students re-excited for STEM careers. I mean, you all have so many great uh, benefits as, as pre-health students that other people could really benefit from. And engaging with your community, engaging with others, uh, in, in the environment that we're in is really what's gonna be key for you uh, later down the line. And Enrique, if I can add, because you know, this is the time now that you might need to feed yourself, you know, to continue to encourage yourself. So if you need mentorship, if you need someone to encourage you, then seek that out. And if, if that is us, mm -hmm. contact us. I know I'm willing to, to give you some encouragement because it is a, a difficult time you know, but, but to stay the course. And we're, that's what we're here for. Yeah, likewise, uh, here with TMDCS and Health Education Service. Uh, and I do also wanna give a quick plug to the uh, SNMA, Student National Medical Association. They have some amazing resources right now, virtually. Uh, they currently launched a, a new podcast with some students talking about issues that they're facing. Uh, I'm pulling it up right now uh, so that I can share the names. Uh, and then they also have a series where they've invited some uh, physicians who are part of different um, branches of medicine and they talk about their own journeys, the issues that they had to face uh, as uh, minorities in the United States pursuing those careers. And I think they're really beneficial, not just to minority students who can really connect with seeing other people who've made it through that path, but also for other students who may uh, not have the ability to connect with others right now and really be able to understand where other folks are coming from uh, and, and understand the, the issues that face a lot of other students. So I'm pulling up the uh, name of the podcast. Uh, the series for videos uh, that SNMA has is called Sowing Seeds Specialty Series. Uh, and actually today at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, 9 p.m. Central Time, they're having a, a session for internal medicine. Um, so make sure to check those out because these are some amazing free resources for you all. Um, and while you're at it, you know, you just mentioned SNMA, the UTMB chapter is hosting a 
pre-med workshop um, on August the 8th. We haven't sent out the announcement yet through the TAP listserv, but that's coming today. And, um, you know, registration is free. It's going to be an event from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And you're going to hear from um, some of the students, some of our faculty. Um, there's going to be a um, introduction lecture. So something which you would see in medical school, as well as um, doing some problem-based learning case experience um, and then some mentoring. So there's going to be opportunities for you to connect with some of our students um, of color and come from underrepresented groups. Perfect. And we will definitely be sharing that on the Texas Health Education Service page to get some folks uh, aware of that. All right. Well, we are uh, about three quarters of the way through this session. Uh, please do keep your qu your questions coming. Uh, we we're, we'll be here till two p.m. Um, but there, there's always so much to talk about. Particularly, I really wanted to address the issue with um, different student organizations and engaging with those in a remote fashion once you're in medical school. Uh, do you happen to know of other organizations that are doing? Um, similar outreach like that, Ms. Neely? Like, like SNMA? Yeah. So um, I know that one organization that's pretty new on our campus um, is called First in the Family, which um, a lot of the members who are part of the organization are first generation medical students or you know going into medicine. And so um, they do a lot of outreach with pre-med students, um, particularly those the schools that they've gone to um, their undergrad alma maters, they, they will reach out to their, their um, home institutions and talk with pre-meds. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure what all the other um, groups are doing, but, um, but I believe that they're doing as much as they can to do mm -hmm. some outreach. Yeah, so uh, um, check, check those out. The best resource that we have right now is our, at our fingertips with the internet. Uh, so check out some of those pages, follow the UTMB page, uh, the SNMA chapter, uh, there, there's so many resources for you all. Uh, another question we have here um, has to do with, uh, and this might be something that each of you might want to chime in on, but the thing that makes students the most excited about UTMB. Um, I so know. a couple of things that come to mind, you know, because I, I've had an opportunity to, you know, meet with a lot of other students at other medical schools, talk to some of those, um, you know, staff members and faculty. You know, it's really about the environment that we have here. Um, just the kind of community feel that you get. Um, everybody wants to help each other. You know, we're not an environment where they don't want to see you succeed. Um, because you have to work together for the first couple of years. I think it's so important that we have that in our, in our, in our environment here. And, and I can't tell you that we're actually doing anything special to keep that going. I just feel like, you know, like-minded people want to be around, you know, each other. And so, you know, they, you thrive on that, you know, when someone else wants to help, you, you can see yourself working together. So, you know, I think that's one of the things that makes us stand out and why students really enjoy being, you know, with UTMB and, and the fact that we're, um, a lot of the faculty and staff are very accessible um, and, and they can communicate well with us. You know, we, we try to have a good relationship, like an open door relationship. And I think that that makes a huge difference too, that you have that support. You, have, you feel like you have that support system um, because anywhere you go, you're gonna get a good education. And I believe you will get a good education, but you know, where can you thrive? Where can you see yourself really um, developing yourself as a medical professional um, in your training and, you know, it, that's those things I think make a huge difference. Absolutely. Yeah, and to you know to add to Latanya, um, we are a small community on on this island, but we have a very very um, tight knit community. Um, you're going to have a faculty member. Um, you're going to see that faculty member at the grocery store, and they're going to stop, and they're going to converse with you, and they're going to know who you are. You're you know it's not like when you're at university and there's 200 students in a class. Um, although there are some classes here that are 230 students, um, but your faculty get to know you and they reach out to you. And when you have issues, um, you can email them and they're going to, most likely they're going to email you back that same day. Um, it's just a very um, tight knit community. 
That, that actually uh, was not something I was expecting. So it, it, I'm glad to hear that because I know uh, having that tight community is very important for so many people. All right, well, uh, these are courage sessions and I, I do want to remember rem, uh, remind everyone that uh, Dr. Beck was the one that came up with the, with the name for these based off of the Winston Churchill quote, uh, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it's the courage to continue that counts. So I want to offer you all uh, some time to address applicants, both current and future, uh, maybe offer some words of wisdom uh, as you see them preparing to come to UTMB. Well, as I've stated before, you know, you should um, find some new strength during this time that you've not found before. And hopefully that will sustain you um, and, and, and show you that you can persevere, that you can overcome, um, and, and that this is just temporary. Um, you know, UTMB is a really great place for you to be at, um, and we hope that you would consider applying and coming to our institution. Um, I think that you're going to get a good experience here and, and a very unique experience, not just because of our unique history um, and, you know, some of the wonderful things that you can experience, but like I said, just because of the type of feel, community feel that you're going to get here. Um, you know, when you go through high school and you go through college, you have those unique experiences that you can look back on and, and, and build on for your for your next level. So uh, we just want to continue to encourage you on the way um, and however we can. You know, medical students come by all the time to just lean on us and talk to us. And, and um, you know, you're going to get that same um same response from us as a pre-med student. So along this journey, even if you're a high school student or a freshman, you know, reach out to us and, and let us talk to you and try to help you along the way um, because it is a journey and it's not going to um, stop once you graduate from college. And even when you graduate from medical school, you're still gonna be on a journey. So, you know, we wanna make sure that we're here to give you the message that we're here to support you. Excellent. And I, and I want to add, um, you know, going back to COVID a little bit, um, you're going through it, we're going through it. So we do know what, what's going on in your lives or what, what's making it difficult for you. And we are taking that into consideration when we're looking at these applications, because we know you've had many missed opportunities. So um, through no fault of your own. So we're, we're definitely taking that into consideration. So I would say don't stress on it too, too much because we're living it just like you are. And so when we see those applications, um, we know, we know. Um, but again, back to the university, um, come by, come see us. That's, we're here, that's what we're here for. And we get so close to, to some of these students that come in and visit us. And, um, and it's nice to even hear students that have graduated and still call me and still text me. And I had one just the other day text me to check up on me and make sure that, you know, she got to know my kids and wanted to know how we were doing. And, and that's, that's what kind of office we are. That's what kind of university we are. And we want to hear from you and we want for you to be a part of our little community. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I do want to add just, we, we do have a couple of minutes left. Uh, we, in our online communities, we did have a post that asked everybody um, when uh, their MCAT has been rescheduled to. Because I know that there's, that's a huge cause for stress and anxiety for so many of our applicants. Uh, and I do want to share some of those results. Um, by and large, um, and I asked uh, for EY 2021 applicants, when did you or are scheduled to take your MCAT or DAT? as of the time of this poll. Uh, the large majority of the students are taking their MCAT till August or July of this year. Uh, any other application cycle, that would be a huge cause for alarm. This year is different. Uh, we had the next, the next two months were June and September when students were able to schedule their MCAT. So even with the expanded MCAT uh, dates and additional times and single days, uh, there are some students who still are not able to get into the time that they wanted. And I've actually heard from some students who had uh, their test sites canceled 
because of rising cases in the area. So just be aware that the schools know that these issues are happening. Uh, I know this is a huge cause for concern for so many students because in a typical year, it would be concerning to take a MCAT this late in the cycle. Uh, but just know that the schools are aware of these, these situations, just as Ms. Silva just said. Uh, so uh, keep at it, have courage, uh, and, and uh, stay the course, because if this is really what you want to do, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy, and definitely it's not going to be any easier this year, uh, yeah. but it will be worth it. So uh, keep at it. Enrique, right. would you also agree that, you know, if you feel the need that you need to wait the application cycle and, and apply next year, that you, we're not going to look at that as any fault of yours or put any fault on you. You know, if, if, if you're feeling a little anxious about it and you would really like to just wait, mm -hmm. um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, you know, we get the question all the time about what can I do in, in that in-between time? Like if I graduated and then I'm applying the next year, I've got this year off, what do I do in that time? And to us, it doesn't matter what you do in that time. You know, so I would encourage you that if you, feel the need, go ahead and wait. Um, don't rush it. Don't rush it, you know, just to get it in because it's okay. Um, and, and we're not gonna, like I said, look at your application any worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's definitely something for each student to consider on their own case yeah. by case basis. You know, if the MCAT's the only thing that's keeping you from applying, maybe you, you should uh, go ahead and take it and apply the cycle. If some activities uh, were canceled and, and your MCAT is, is still pending, maybe uh, you've done well enough over the past few years that uh, it really didn't affect your overall application. Um, but in the instances where um, it was really devastating for your application, uh, maybe waiting is a good option. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a perfectly valid uh, move for a lot of students. I really urge you to connect with your advisor to talk about your situation and really address all of your options. If waiting is what's in your best interest, then we are glad to be here next year uh, to help you out with this process. And I'm sure I'm, I'm not just speaking for us at Team DCS and Health Education Service, but also UTMB. Uh, and, and if it's two years from now, uh, same thing. Um, and so really it, it, it comes down, you all know your situation the best. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I can't offer a blanket statement that will apply for everybody because uh, there isn't a blanket statement. Um, and, and that's something I really try to emphasize is that this, this isn't a cookie cutter journey. You know, mm -hmm. there's not a checklist of all the things that you need to do to get in. Uh, there, the schools, um, particularly what we've heard here is uh, the schools aren't looking for a profile of a student. We're looking for people who are going to be a good fit for the school. And it's not just one person, it's going to be a variety of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if your situation calls for uh, delaying your application for up to a year or two, don't fret. We're here to help and uh, just keep moving forward with, with uh, enhancing your application and being prepared for that. I will say if you are going to wait uh, for a while, you might want to continue to stay academically engaged because uh, you're going to have a hard time <laughs> if, if you have to find a letter uh, or an evaluator and it's been two years since your class, uh, since your last class, or if you're trying to prove academic preparation in your application uh, and your most recent coursework is two years old, uh, that does raise some issues, which is why I really urge you to meet with your advisor and talk about where you are in the process and, and uh, the next steps for you. All right, well, uh, we have reached the end of today's Courage session. Um, thank you both so, so much. I know you're in the middle of orientation right now, so I'm really thankful for you taking the time to help us with uh, understanding UTMB and, and some of the issues that have been coming up. But most of all, thank you so much for the encouraging words for our students. Uh, we can't say them enough. Look forward to your application. We do. All right. And on behalf of TMDSAS, the Texas Health Education Service, and UTMB, we'd like to wish all of our applicants all the best of luck, and we are here to help when you need us.
Uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. We will be having the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in El Paso, uh, Paul L. Foster School of Medicine. So join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Central and uh, we'll talk to them. Thank you so much.